Today on 21st Century, a global epidemic, death on the world's roads. Can we bring the numbers down? She was a rambunctious, happy little girl and she'd uh, stand up on the 44 bus and sing the wheels on the bus go round and round. One and a quarter million deaths on the world's roads every year. When I looked at the boy, I thought it was over. And now here I'm lying with a broken neck because I got into a crash because I got distracted and I had a crash. Was it worth making the call? The answer is no. The struggle to make our roads safer around the globe. She was a rambunctious, happy little girl and she'd uh, stand up on the 44 bus and sing the wheels on the bus go round and round. She would stand up to someone who was bigger than her. and In know, the playground she would stand up and put her hands on her hips. And look up at them. <laughs> <laughs> she was, she was kind of She was like, you move over because I'm coming I'm through. I'm coming through. Um, <laughs> I don't know where she got that personality. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's a one in a million chance though, but there happens to be a, a driver driving up to where my daughter was being run over. And from what I understand, it was a family member that had a dash cam installed. Grandma was walking with my daughter, hand in hand, where she was so close to her, you couldn't see where my daughter is. And a car coming over, making a left turn, and you, all you know is he went over something. Grandma gets knocked down and she kicks the floor. And then you see the back tire go over something. You know, I was probably screaming and crying. And then you walk into the room with like 15 doctors. You think it's maybe a dream or something, a nightmare. I mean, it was a lot to take in, thinking your daughter was safe with grandma at her house, expecting to go see her to, you know, for dinner and having the rest of the family being there to all of a sudden your daughter doesn't exist anymore. After Shipei and Amy lost their daughter, Allison, they decided they had to do something. I think for me, was a lot of it is trying to understand what happened, how could it happen, and uh, find meaning behind it, how to prevent this from happening. You know, we still have a son. We later had another child, so it is, um, you know, there's this meaning behind it from preventing it from happening ever again for our family. They helped found an effective campaigning group, Families for Safe Streets, in New York. Basically, it's a group that you don't want to be a part of. You're either a family member of someone who died in traffic violence, or you've been severely injured in traffic violence. They campaigned for a lower speed limit in the city. And in late 2014, New York's default speed limit was lowered to 25 miles per hour from 30. 
but Shipei and Amy are still angry that the driver who killed their daughter didn't even have to pay a fine and his license was revoked for a mere 30 days. Stories like ours that the driver has struck and killed our daughter happens every day. The difference in our case is that we have a video about it to show that our daughter and, and her grandma were not at fault. But otherwise, this, story, this happens all the time and it's whatever the driver says is taken as the truth. For them and for families for safe streets, it's not a road accident, it's a road crash. The word accident implies too much that it's an acceptable and inevitable phenomenon. We shouldn't accept any fatality. One life lost on our roadways is, is one life too many. Shipei and Amy are heartened by the fact that New York City has embarked on a campaign called Vision Zero, the goal to eliminate road deaths entirely. And in 2015, the city had the lowest number of road fatalities on record at 230. The point of Vision Zero is we don't accept that fatalities are inevitable. We do believe that we can, between engineering and enforcement and education, the goal is to bring that number down to zero. Vision Zero is based on the successful Swedish model, which brought road fatalities down to the world's lowest level in that country, 2.7 per 100,000 people per year. Part of that campaign was to establish lower speed limits. We lowered our default speed limit from 30 to 25 miles an hour. We pointed out that if you were involved in a crash where unfortunately you hit someone going 30 miles an hour, you're twice as likely to kill that person as if you hit them at 25. A second part of successful road safety, engineering, is physically changing the layout of roads. For example, New York's Queens Boulevard, which had become so notoriously dangerous, it was known as the Boulevard of Death. Well, Queens Boulevard is a very, very challenging roadway. As you can see, very, uh, very wide roadway, lots of lanes of traffic, cars driving very quickly. So first of all, we've rationalized the design, closed some of the slip lanes, added a bike lane that you can see behind me, and improved the pedestrian crossing areas so pedestrians have more space and more time to get across the street. Riding bicycles in New York has increased fourfold since 2000 partly made possible and safer by a multiplicity of new bike lanes like these ones. The city also changed the crossing on which Allison died, altering the traffic lights to give pedestrians more time to cross and restricting parking on the corners that block a driver's view. But not all drivers follow the new rules. For example, the car on the left should not be parked on those new white lines so another Allison could be at risk. New Yorkers are always in a hurry, but we challenge drivers to pause and ask, is it worth it? Is it worth running over a child because you're running late? Is it worth picking up the phone when it could mean a family must pick out a grave for their child? Is it worth texting a friend? when that message could force a fair father to text the date and time of their child's funeral. When I looked at the boy, when I looked at the boy, I thought it was over. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Was this worth it? A school and a busy road in Kyalicha Township outside Cape Town, South Africa. Early one morning, a taxi was in a hurry. Inga Matakwana, a five-year-old boy walking with his 12-year-old cousin, had almost reached his school, but he got no further. The taxi driver thought that he would um, bypass the, the pedestrian crossing by driving onto the pavement. It took him 
it hit him and the driver hit the child and then came back and then I'm sure he was just thinking the child was not there and it came to Inga again. Inga was pulled away from the cousin who was holding his hand and then dragged under the taxi and then ran over again when uh, the taxi driver reversed and then went forward again. Taxi driver then fled the scene um, but was later caught and arrested at his home. Many in South Africa say that minibus taxi drivers are especially reckless. The driver in Inga's case was licensed, but many aren't. This minibus taxi driver agreed to give his views on the problem. So other people, they drive bad because they are looking for money, rush for other people. Uh, others, they drive bad because they don't know how to drive. They just drive taxis all for the sake of driving. You see, you see, if, if, I have, if I've got a car, a tax in my, in my house, and my old son is there, I can give you a tax and drive without a license, you see? And there's no training or anything like that to be a taxi driver? Mm, I can say no. Son, I'm not going to go to the house. Nowadays, it's better to drive a taxi, because if you don't drive a taxi, there's no jobs you can see. There's no jobs you can have your certificate, but if you don't have a job, you can go, at least go drive a taxi, you won't rob someone, you see? Breaking the law and being seen to get away with it. The behavior that's manifested by minibus taxi drivers is very, very visible to other motorists, and it creates a widespread perception of a lack of enforcement and therefore of a general lawlessness on the roads. In this case, the driver was taken to court, but initially he remains out of jail, something that infuriates Inga's grandmother. I'm very angry. I want him to be sentenced. I want him to be inside jail and not outside. He was a very creative boy. He used to like to draw and make cars to play with, and he, he loved food. <laughs> the driver did eventually receive a three year jail sentence. In the meantime, Inga's school continues to make huge efforts to protect its children. They organize what's called a scholar patrol to help children cross the busy road. They receive regular training provided by the Department of Transport. The little ones, the little kids, they are very close to my heart. If I can keep them safe on the road, I will be very happy. I will sleep peacefully at my house knowing that I've saved so many lives on the road, especially the most vulnerable, the little children at primary schools. One major problem is alcohol. Up to 50% of drivers killed in South Africa have blood alcohol levels over the legal limit, as do 60% of pedestrians who die on the roads. These grim security camera images were released as part of a road safety awareness campaign launched by the government of the Western Cape, which includes Cape Town. Public education is paramount, but in a country where a major part of the population lives in poverty, it's hard to get road safety high on the public agenda. Ordinary people are not motivated by road safety as a particular issue. They will have other societal problems that they'll identify before road safety, and particularly things like poverty, inequality and unemployment. I remember a bail hearing of a suspect who'd killed a couple of people where the magistrate said, it's a tragedy when people are killed on the road or when people die on the road, but it happens. The attitude conveyed was very much that this is just something that is inevitable and that society should accept. In an attempt to shift attitudes like these, the Western Cape launched this ad, focusing on seatbelts.
the message is that a person without a seatbelt can fly out of their seat and kill the other passengers. Got four dead. They say the one without the seatbelt did the damage over. But how do you influence people? Some research shows that horrifying people without giving them practical tools to avoid road crashes can be counterproductive. One group in South Africa approaches drivers directly with a positive Morning, message. Sir. We're just creating awareness about road safety. No donation, we're from the Quad Para Association. We represent quadriplegics and paraplegics, and we're just telling the public that, please, will you sign a pledge to use your seatbelt when you drive? Ari Serilis' slogan, buckle up, we don't want new members. He's particularly persuasive about distracted driving, especially because of cell phones. Why did I make that call back to the office? And I hear I'm lying with a broken neck, because I got into a crash because I got distracted and I had a crash. Was it worth making the call? The answer is no. It's estimated that through loss of earnings and direct costs to the government, South Africa loses 10% of its GDP each year to road crashes. If you become spinal cord injured in South Africa and you have no resources, you become completely dependent on the state. It's going to cost the state millions. Who funds the state? The taxpayers. Second of all, if you're working, and you participate in distracted driving, and you don't use your seatbelt, and you crash, you now can't go back to the workplace. The country cannot afford this amount of road crashes. We've got to stop it somehow. South Africa's rate of road fatalities is the second highest in Africa, at 32 per 100,000 per year. And it's representative of many middle-income countries, where populations are growing and more cars are on the road. The United States has a relatively high rate for a developed country, at around 11 per 100,000. But the good news is that it's been proven that these figures can be brought down. Apart from world leader Sweden, the United Kingdom has halved its level to just under 3 per 100,000 in the last decade. The key elements were greater enforcement, road alterations and public awareness campaigns like this. The video here is taken from a motorcyclist who had a camera on his helmet and recorded his own death. I know he rode fast that day. He loved speed. driver didn't see him and turned right across his path. David didn't have time to take evasive action. Given that the last hundred years has seen a massive increase in road traffic worldwide, there's now a race between improved road safety on the one hand and on the other, the sheer number of people on the road. In recent years, traffic fatalities have plateaued, 
but at the enormously high number of 1.25 million a year, with 50 million injured. All experts agree that if this race is to be won, governments have to use a multi-track approach, the three E's of enforcement, education and engineering. This last includes car design. A recent United Nations General Assembly resolution calls on all car manufacturers to meet minimum UN safety standards by 2020. I'm looking for any lights that are visible. And it looks as though we've got a reversing light on the red Jeep. That's ahead. Laws and policies are one thing, but ultimately a great deal depends on the behaviour of individuals. And one part of education is helping drivers focus more on safety. And at the end of the road, at the stop sign, I'm going to turn right. So mirror first, then my signal, my position's good. It's an always stop, so I'm going to gently bring the car to a standstill. Reapply the signal because it's the running commentary you're hearing is a technique taught to advanced drivers to increase focus and awareness. And I'm turning onto a street that's 30 miles per hour. There's a car waiting to come out on the right hand side. The driver's not looking at me yet, so I want to see them turn their head towards me. There it is. We now have head contact. Eddie Wren is the chief instructor of Advanced Drivers of America. He's a former British police officer member of the traffic escort for the royal family and chair of the International Road Federation Road Safety Group. There's no escaping the fact that driving is always one of the most dangerous things statistically that you do every day. And most of us drive every day. Lesson one. Everybody agrees that texting causes severe driver distraction. But what about phones, hands-free or handheld? Answer, both are equally dangerous. For handheld and hands-free cell phones, research showed that the risk of having a crash while using those phones, a serious or fatal crash, was four times higher than for somebody who's not using a phone. Lesson two, how much space should you leave between you and the car in front of you? Answer, three seconds of driving time. The argument that you don't need a long stopping distance because the guy ahead has to brake. 95% of the time, maybe 98% of the time, is perfectly true. But what if? Some things when you're driving only have to happen once in your entire driving lifetime. And if you're not doing it right at that moment, you could die. In WHO, we deal with statistics, but behind every statistic, there are the human being. The people that are lost to road traffic accidents are normally young people. I mean, it's not just the individual that suffer, but also their family, their relatives. Road fatalities are a major priority for the World Health Organization, and we are halfway through the UN Decade of Action for Road Safety which was launched in 2011. And one of the new Global Sustainable Development Goals, SGG number three, aims to halve road deaths and injuries by 2020. Shipe and Amy made their own contribution to enforcement and accountability by bringing a civil suit against the driver who knocked Allison down. He's now barred from driving for five years and had to pay compensation. Their campaign also helped bring in a new law, which means that drivers in New York now face criminal penalties for killing or injuring a pedestrian on a crosswalk. We know how to make our roads safer, but will change come quickly enough to spare more children like Allison and Inga, along with their families? up on a future episode of 21st century. In India, a child is abducted every eight minutes. 
Most are girls. Half are never found.